Hello, I am Seema and welcome to part 23 of the chapter Equilibrium. In this video, I am going to tell you about ionic equilibria in solutions. There are two types of compounds, mainly the ionic compounds and the covalent compounds. You are already aware of them. Covalent compounds are where the atoms are bound together by covalent bonds, that is by sharing of electrons. And ionic compounds are compounds where one atom or a group of atoms loses electrons and a, one atom or a group of atoms gains electrons. And the group of atoms that loses electrons or the atom which loses electrons becomes positively charged and the one that gains electrons becomes negatively charged. Now, these positively and negatively charged atoms or groups of atoms, they combine together and they stay together as compounds due to coulombic forces of attraction or electrical forces of attraction because positive attracts negative. Such compounds are called ionic compounds. There's a third category also of the coordinate compounds, the coordination compounds, but you will be studying about this later. Our main concern is about these two types of compounds. When you have ionic compounds, these ionic compounds, they have, as I told you, the positive and the negatively charged ions. And these ions, when you put an ionic compound in water, they form a solution. And water is a solvent that itself has positive and negative. It's a polar solvent, we call it. Polar means it has the two poles, positive and negative. The positive is H positive and the negative is OH negative. And it is partially polar. So when you put an ionic compound into water, it usually, most of the ionic compounds, they dissociate into their ions. They break down into the ions when they go into water. The positive and the negative parts, they separate. So that is called that so this ionic compound, it dissociates in solution and therefore it establishes, it forms an equilibrium. Now there is one more difference between ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Ionic compounds, because they have positive and negative charged particles, if you put them in water and they ionize, they tend to conduct electricity. Why? Because electricity is nothing but moving charges. And therefore, when you have charges which are separated in the liquid, that liquid starts conducting electricity. So now, if we take this example that we did in video 19, we have discussed this ionic equilibrium in video 19, where I told you about the effect of concentration on equilibrium. And we took this, uh, this equilibrium between ferric ions and thiocyanate ions, and uh, in equilibrium with the ferric thiocyanate uh, ion itself. Do you see that in this equilibrium, all the species are ionic? This is positively charged, negatively charged, and this is positively charged. So, uh, such an equilibrium where you have the ions which are the participants of the equilibrium would be known as an ionic equilibrium. And since ions, the ionization of these uh, ionic compounds takes place in water or in a solvent, we say it is ionic equilibrium in solution. And such solutions which have ionic equilibrium or the presence of ions in them would conduct electricity logically. So aqueous solution of sugar, they say, it does not conduct electricity. This is now, I'm reading this according to what is given in your book. The aqueous solution of sugar that is sucrose is C12H22O11. It does not conduct electricity. What does it tell us about sucrose? That sucrose must be a covalent compound. And it's true, sucrose is a covalent compound. And therefore, when you dissolve sugar in water, it does not conduct electricity. So aqueous solution of sucrose or sugar does not conduct electricity while that of sodium chloride does. If you take a solution of sodium chloride, it conducts electricity. Why? Because as soon as you add sodium chloride to water, the sodium and chlorine, they dissociate, they break down and it results in the formation of uh, the separation of positive and negative charges. Now, when you pass electric current through them, you have charge carriers in the form of these ions, which conduct, which carry the charge and therefore electricity is conducted. So conductance of 
electricity would go up if you increase the concentration of sodium chloride. You add a pinch of sodium chloride, it starts conducting electricity. You add a little more sodium chloride, let us say a teaspoonful, the conductance goes up. So the more the ions are, the more is the conductance. So the more ions that are present in the solution, the more carriers of the electric charge would be there. And therefore the conductance of electricity it usually goes up when you add more ionic compound to it. So Michael Faraday was a scientist who classified substances on the basis of their electrical conductance. He made the main feature not the type of bonding, the ionic or the covalent bonding. He said he classified them on the basis of their electrical conductance. He said there are some substances which are electrolytes, especially electric conductance in, in solution. So he called, he classified substances on the basis of their conductance when they are present in the form of a solution and he classified them into two categories that was electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Electrolytes would be those compounds that conduct electricity in solution and non-electrolytes would be those substances which do not conduct electricity in solution. Now, logically, on the basis of what I've told you just now, what kind of compounds would be electrolytes and what kind of compounds would be non-electrolytes? The electrolytes would be ionic in nature and the non-electrolytes would be covalent in nature. So basically, he said that ionic compounds which dissolve in water and conduct electricity, they are called electrolytes. Now he further classified these electrolytes into two categories. Not all ionic compounds conduct electricity equally well. Some of them are very good conductors, but some of them do not conduct electricity as happily. So he classified them into strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. So what did he say was strong electrolytes? Strong electrolytes, according to him, were compounds like sodium chloride, which dissociate completely in water. When you put them in water, every each unit, that is uh, the formula unit we call it, of the ionic compound, it breaks into the ions and it dissolves completely. Such a compound like sodium chloride, it shows 100% ionization in water. It gets Now, the word ionization, when I'm using it here, it means dissociation. It undergoes complete dissociation in water and results in the formation of sodium and chloride ions, which are now free to conduct electricity. electricity. Such electrolytes would be strong electrolytes. And then the second was the weak electrolytes like acetic acid. Acetic acid is CH3COOH. It is a weak acid. We call it a weak acid. And why is it weak and a weak electrolyte? Acetic acid on putting in water does not dissociate, rather dissociates very little in water. Only less than 5% of acetic acid dissociates in water. 95% of it remains as acetic acid. So what happens for this re reaction? where acetic acid dissociates not completely into water. You have the ions H positive, CH3COO negative, and they get to be in equilibrium with the acetic acid. In the case of sodium chloride, they might have been in equilibrium, but that equilibrium would not be uh, significant. Why? Because the dissociation is 100%. If there is one odd molecule, a few molecules which are going back and forming an ACL, they do not really affect the concentration of the solution. But here, the concentrations of the products and the reactant, they are appreciated, they are comparable. They're, rather, do you see only 5% is dissociating and this 5% of iron is in, is in equilibrium with the undissociated acetic acid. It is these solutions, that is, it is only the weak electrolytes where you would actually see equilibrium. Equilibrium will not be observable where you have a 100% dissociation because there equilibrium means nothing because the concentration of sodium and chloride is almost 100% because 100% of sodium chloride dissociated. If one odd molecule goes back, it doesn't mean anything. But here the equilibrium establishes between the undissociated and the dissociated ions, the undissociated acid or whatever ionic compound or electrolyte that you took. Now that you understand that electrolytes, they are of two types, weak electrolytes and strong electrolytes. Weak electrolytes are the ones which have equilibrium. This is just an introduction 
to the ionic equilibrium in solution. Now, which are the type of ionic equilibria that we will be studying? There are three classes of compounds, acids, bases, and salts, which produce ions in solution. So when we are going to be studying now in the consecutive videos, we are going to be studying about the ionic equilibria in solution. We are actually going to be studying about the acidic equilibrium, equilibrium involving acids, bases and salts. One more thing, yes, in weak electrolytes, equilibrium established between ions and unionized molecules. I did explain this to you. So let us now move to these three categories. What are these three categories of electrolytes which we would be studying about in the consecutive videos. Acids, now I'm going to give you a very, very basic, the first introduction of acids and bases which you must have done in your class 9 and 10. And uh, we'll go into the details of uh, the definitions and how a substance is an acid in the next video. But right now, let me just give a basic idea of what acids are, what bases are and how salts are different from them. Acids usually are substances which dissociate in water and give rise to a positively charged particle or ion which is responsible for its acidic character. Usually it is H positive and not that it is not H positive, when we do other definitions we come to it. But for the time being let us consider that those substances which have a positively charged particle which is responsible for its acidic character which is usually H positive, that would be an acid. So we say anything that gives H positive in water on dissociation is an acid. So what's a base? A base is something that dissociates in water and gives you a hydroxyl ion, OH negative ion. So this is again the first definition, we are not going into the others. So the, if anything that has OH negative ion, an ionic compound, you put it in water, it gives rise to OH negative ion, that uh, ionic compound is going to act as a base. So we see acids are those ionic compounds that have H positive and bases are those compounds which have OH negative. So it is the negative part of an ionic compound which is responsible for its basic character and it's the positive part of an acid which is responsible for its acidic character. Now, if you take an acid and you take a base and you make them react with each other, such a reaction where you have an acid reacting with a base, what is it called? Neutralization. It is called you're neutralizing the acid and the base. Why does it? You've done this in lower classes. That neutralization occurs when an acid reacts with the base, it neutralizes. The acid neutralizes the base and the base neutralizes the acid. How does it do it? The positive part which is responsible for the acidic character in the acid. It combines with the negative part of the base which is responsible for its basic character and those two they combine to form a compound. If hydrogen combines with OH it results in the formation of H2O which is neutral, it's water. So the acid when it reacts with a base it results in the formation of water but what are you left with? You are left with the negative part of the acid and the positive part of the base which now combine and they combine to form an ionic compound for example sodium combines with chlorine to give you sodium chloride. Here I have sulfuric acid H2SO4 it forms H positive and SO4 2 negative ions and magnesium hydroxide which gives you magnesium ions and hydroxide ions. I took this, you know, HCl reacts with sodium hydroxide and it causes neutralization. So the hydrogen and the OH, they combine to form water, but the sodium and the chlorine, they get together to give you sodium chloride and that's the salt that I used as an example here. In the second example, I had H2SO4 and the second example here is magnesium hydroxide. So I took the hydrogen from sulfuric acid and the OH from magnesium hydroxide and resulted in the formation of water, two molecules of water, and the magnesium of the magnesium hydroxide and the sulfate of the sulfuric acid. They combine to form magnesium sulfate. Now these compounds which are formed as a result of the reaction between the acid and the base resulting in neutralization, the other product that is formed is known as a salt. But 
since whether it's an acid which has a positive part which is responsible for its acidic character or it's a base which has a negative part which is responsible for its basic character or it's a salt which has a positive part and a negative part which are not contributing towards acidity or basicity irrespective of how the ions are behaving all of these are ionic compounds and all of these would fulfill the category of electrolytes that Michael Faraday had spoken of. Electrolytes are those substances which conduct electricity when dissolved in water. All of these are the ones that would behave as electrolytes. And there would be some which would behave as strong electrolytes. There would be some which would behave as weak electrolytes. If there is an acid which is a strong electrolyte, we call that acid a strong acid. And if it's a weak electrolyte, we call it a weak acid. Similarly, the base can be a strong base or a weak base depending on how much of it dissociates in water. Or a strong electrolyte uh, as a salt or a weak electrolyte as a salt. But it is only the weak electrolytes among all of these which would show a proper equilibrium. And those would be the equations or the reactions that we would be interested in in the, in the coming videos. So with this, I'll finish this video. If you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends, and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.